perspectives and views about who you are, where you came from, what your end is, where you'll be, and why you're here. Ever since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, men have wandered aimlessly in search of the answer. We have given ourselves to addiction, materialism, power, greed, sex, and whatever else, but still, we never quite understand, and the question looms over our heads like an ominous cloud. Who am I? We search in all the wrong places, seeking it in all the wrong relationships, and still, Deep down in our hearts is an unsettled issue. The question remains, who am I? Where do I come from? Where am I going? There are, in the world, essentially two perspectives. In the whole world, their religions, their science, their philosophy, their socialism, their psychology, they all stem from these two perspectives. The one, the one perspective is an is a anthropo, anthropos, anthropocentric. Anthropos is the Greek word for man. Centric means center. So the one world philosophy that really is responsible for all of modernism, science, philosophy, the New Age movement, all fall under that particular category. <coughs> Excuse me. And that, and that category is anthropocentric. The Greek word anthropos. Oh. <laughs> Trace, Lise, when we, when we go on our shopping, we'll just put, put markers on there, will you? Uh, and. Anthropocentric. Okay? And from that worldview, we get our science. I'm just going to put an S there. We get our, our philosophy. We get our social studies. And, and under our social studies, they have <coughs> theology or as they would put it, religion. This view is really what gave birth to evolution and the theory of evolution. This theory is what is responsible for so much violence in the earth. Because under this theory exists the thought or mentality that it's survival of the fittest. And there is no absolute right or there is no absolute wrong. That man is the center of the universe. That we crawled up out of a primordial ooze. That there is no God to be accountable. God is an afterthought in the evolution of man. And he's just uh, a, a, a necessary a crutch of those who are crippled in society and need to believe in something higher than themselves. Not good. That theory right there is responsible for most of the New Age philosophy that we're dealing with, and much of it has seeped into the church. It's, it's responsible for the violence. This is a view that Hitler maintained. Hitler was an evolutionist, and he believed in the German Reich as being the superior race, and in that stupidity... He was quite okay with this uh, extinguishing six million Jews because, after all, the German race was better than the Jewish race. And that thought has been <laughs> prevalent throughout history. Hitler, by no means, is the only one who held that view. Very destructive view. But unfortunately, in the Christian church today, or in the world today, but much of, like I said, has seeped into the Christian church that is the prevalent view, and this is what we're dealing with as, as Christians as we go out into the world and attempt to evangelize our fellows. That's why they can, that's why abortion's okay, because my right to life 
is better than this child's or unborn child's life, right to life. And my need outweighs their need. My rights outweigh their rights. This stinking thinking that is anthropocentric, it permeates every part of our society today. Because while they leave God out in their moral and social development, which is really a decline, they just do away with God, then all the rest of the, the things that pertain to humanity, the sciences, the philosophies, uh, the socialism, the psychology, all of that, is subjective to whoever's writing and talking about whatever topic they're talking about. My heart for you as a pastor is that you understand what we're dealing with. Okay? And this is pertinent to the question of who am I? Because if you don't know who you are, then you become subject to the stupidity that is in the world. And what is operating them, or what's motivating them, and to what, what inspires them. Okay. The other view. Nothing like a diaper wipe. <laughs> <laughs> no, no jokes about clean ass. <laughs> now the other view that we that we have to choose from is theocentric. One word, but I'm going to break it up here so that you can understand theocentric. And theo is the Greek word theology, or theos is the Greek word for God. It's the Greek word we get theology from. Theologos is the study of God. Theocentric puts God at the center of all things. And when God is at the center of it, then science philosophy, social studies, and religion are God-centered. And the thing that makes this the right perspective is because when we are subject to God, <coughs> then how many know, we just finished up the series on We Shall All Appear Before the Judgment Seat of Christ, that when we have God to be accountable for, it changes the way we conduct business with one another. Amen? Amen. Amen. It also, and this is where we're going to get into our sermon this morning, it also answers the legitimate question of, who am I, where did I come from, and where am I going? Because without God, we're left with the, 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 the awful choice of believing that I'm nothing more than a one-celled amoeba that slithered up out, and I feel like that some days, that slithered up out of the primordial ooze, there's no relevance for my being. There's no purpose or fulfillment for me being here. That my life and all that happens in it is random. There is no God to answer to. Do you see the digression that takes place here without God in our community? And it makes it okay for me to act in ways that are contrary to your well-being, Kyle, because after all, what I need or want far outweighs what's good for you or your family. Scary. Very scary. But that's what we're contending with today. In that theology, we get our Christology, the study of Christ. Soteriology, the study of salvation. Anthropology, where do men come from? See, there's billions of trillions of dollars of people that are going out, men that will one day be dust, go out and dig in the dust of the earth to find somebody that's already turned to dust so that they can put it in a museum where it will become dust just so they can end up with the answer that it will be dust. <laughs> and the only thing they got right in all of that is the prophecy of God telling Adam in the Garden of Eden, now that you've sinned, you will be ashes to ashes and dust to dust because all their study and all their billions of dollars and all their grants to go dig in the dirt and dig up yesterday's civilizations that God wiped out because of their sin and their attempt to wipe God out from their civilization, it's all dust. And in their stupidity, they will be dust. 
Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. Because they left God out of it. And how many know that when we have God, that's not the end of the road for us? I'm not going to stop being ashes and ashes. Ashes and dust. I almost slipped there. <laughs> Ask me to say that three times real fast. <laughs> Okay, we do believe in talking in tongues around here. I'll prove it once in a while. <laughs> so how do we defend ourselves against this, these great evils that exist in our society? Well, the first and foremost important thing that we do is we arm ourselves with truth. And how many know truth starts here? You hear the word of truth. Mm -hmm. It enters through the portals of your ears and your eyes. So let me know it's important to read it for yourselves. All right? I expect you to go home and do your homework and check on what I'm saying. I don't expect you to take everything I say blindly. In fact, I'm looking forward to the day that, that some of you will come up and say, Hey, you know what, Pastor? I'm not sure you got this right. And that's what this quote on that scripture. I welcome that. Because I will tell you, I'm as flawed as any human being walking on the face of this earth, and I don't have it all figured out. I study to show myself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but I make, I make mistakes. So you need to go home and do your own homework and figure it out for yourself. Amen. Acts 19. Acts 19. See, my heart for you, as we, and as we get into this further in the next couple weeks, it'll probably be three weeks, I would imagine. Uh, as, my heart, as we get into this, my heart for you is that you answer these relevant, relevant questions in your own life. But not only can you answer them, but it will equip you to live the way that God wants you to, and in victory. Say victory again. Victory. Victory. Oh, victory in Jesus. My Savior forever. He loved me and bought me with his being love. Amen. I know there's a choir in this congregation. <laughs> And I quickly backed out of it, as, as you noticed. <laughs> did you hear the heavenly pitch when I did? <laughs> I just got to learn how to sing solo. So yeah, low, yeah. No, I did. That's why I backed out. <laughs> <laughs> Acts 19, verse 8. Now, this is a glimpse of what's going on in the church. And as you read this, I wonder, I, I pray that God will give us a glimpse of what it means to be a New Testament church. Acts 19.8, And he entered into the synagogue and spoke boldly for the space of three months, reasoning and persuading as to the things concerning the kingdom of God. How many know that we have to reason and persuade those who are lost? And we do so by being equipped with the truth. I'm not going to come in here every week and give you a feel-good message. I want to give you something to sink your teeth in. I want you to get an appetite for the meat of God's truth. I want you to develop a, an appetite for meat. Because once you do, you'll never be able to survive on milk again. How many know that a child goes through seasons where it drinks Similac, and then it gets to a point where it can, drink some, where it can eat some peas, and then it goes back, and then it gets to a point where it can actually chew on a piece of chicken? Try to put that child back on Similac after it's tasted too much. <laughs> oh, it ain't happening. <laughs> meat. Say meat. 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 Something you can sink your teeth into. Something that makes you walk and go away and, and go, hmm. Something that makes you, when the evening news comes on and you hear their stupid per per views of the world, or NPR, and you're listening to the philosophers that are on there talking about uh, what's going on in, our, in the institutions and universities across America, and you can see exactly how far away from God they've gotten because now you're trained in the truth. But when they, verse 9, 
And he entered into the synagogue and spoke boldly in the space of three months, reasoning and persuading as to the things concerning the kingdom of God. And when he, and when some were hardened and disobedient, disobedience, hmm, it will keep you out of the kingdom. Speaking evil of the way, before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. I mean, no, God gives us a brain, and we're supposed to use it for a reason. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's good preaching. And this continued for the space of two years, so that all they that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Now, how many know that God does miracles, and he follows the truth with signs and wonders? Amen? Amen. He does. Because God's going to come along and confirm the reality of his truth in, in our midst. That's just something we can look forward to. When you get a hold of the truth, then you can expect the Holy Spirit to anoint that truth with the blessings of heaven. That's just part and parcel. It's like the right hand and the left hand. And that's consistent throughout the New Testament. And it should be consistent in a church. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so much that the sick were carried away from his body were carried away from his body, body handkerchiefs or aprons. In other words, Paul was just blessing handkerchiefs. Don't get me started, but that's some stupid stuff going on TV these days. <laughs> or aprons, and the diseases departed from them. And the reason that was going on then, and I'll tell you the difference between now and what's going on on TV, is because then the church was so new, and the world was so big, and there were so many hurting people, that the God, the, the God, to meet the needs of the multitudes, he had to, Paul was blessed to, uh, blessed to anoint the handkerchiefs so the handkerchiefs could go where Paul couldn't. Now, God's got plenty of saints in the earth, and if we would do our work, that foolishness on TV would not even exist. They pull scriptures like this, and they misuse them for their own greedy gain. Send us $400, and we'll send you a handkerchief. That is not a God, and that's not what was going on here. Robin, I can't, I can't get over to Fruita today. Lord, I pray you bless this handkerchief in the name of Jesus. Robin, would you take that to Fruita and go bless those sick people in that nursing home? Do you see the difference? Huge difference. So Paul and, his, and what he had to bring to the, to the world at that point in time, there were so many people and the need was so great, that God special, that God gave uh, Paul a special unction and a special anointing here so that the message could be carried forth. Because there weren't enough disciples to do the work. How many know that that's changed? The body of Christ is all over the world. And God has soldiers in every foxhole in, in the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. And I'm not saying God can't or wouldn't do that again. I'm saying that there's a whole bunch of people that are presuming on stupid. But certain of the certain also of the strolling Jews, I like that strolling along. <laughs> exorcist. Now these were Jews that were exorcists. They went around for money, casting demons out of people. Took upon them to name, oh, to name over them that had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, "I adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches." So let me paint a little quick little picture here. These guys are going around, and they're going out into the community, and they're finding these people that are possessed with demons. They don't know Jesus. How many remember that? What was the third commandment? Candida, I know you'll remember. Jake, do you remember? The signs with... Huh? Not to take the name of the Lord God in vain. Amen? Remember the third commandment? So these guys are taking the Lord Jesus' name, and they don't even know him. And they're taking the Lord's name and they're trying to cast out devils when they don't know him. Well, I just, I'm going to share a passage of scripture with you. It's going to come in crystal clear view in just a second. Some of you have probably questioned about it many, many times. And this is the response they get. I adjure you to come out by, by, by the name of Jesus and Paul who he preaches. How many know that secondhand information is not good? And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, a chief priest, who did this. And the evil spirit answered and said unto them, Jesus I know, you bet, bet he does, and Paul I know, yeah, you better, because he's a general in Jesus' army, but who are you? I want you to put in parentheses, but who are you? 
See, there is the sum of our, our sermon today. Who are you? And if you're going to go out into the world and make a difference and do what God called you to do, you better know who you are. Dan, would you go check the parking lot, please? Thank you. Who are you? Because though this man was possessed, and these men were talking directly to a demon, the same question is posed, and it's asked of you a thousand times a day. Who are you? It might not be as blatant as this man. It might not be as predominant as this man. But the devil still is asking you today, every time you're confronted with temptation, every time you're confronted with peer pressure, every time you're asked to do something that is contrary to your conscience or the will of God, the devil is proposing to you the question, Who are you? Who are you? And you better know, and this is the reason why. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and mastered both of them. Okay, that's so two of the seven sons got their butts kicked. Nip it in the butt. And mastered both of them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. It's safe to say that there's a couple guys here that just didn't know who they are, right? Yeah. And this became known to all, both Jews and Greeks, that dwelt in Ephesus, and fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Many also of them that had been to, many of all, many also of them that had believed came confessing and declaring their deeds. And not a few of them that practiced their magical arts brought their books together and all their sorcery and burned them together in the sight of all. And they can and they counted the price of them and found that. 50,000 pieces of silver, so mightily grew the word of the Lord and, and prevailed. See, that little scene caused such a stir in the midst of the city. Because that demon said, I know who Jesus is, and I know who Paul is, but who are you? Give me my clothes back. And out the door he went, <laughs> butt naked and ashamed. <laughs> That's a rough spot for me. Talk about a tough day at the office. <laughs> Why hope they go through this? <clears throat> Will you go for me today, Dad? Well, I want you to go over here and take care of this guy that's hanging out by the synagogue. Just go over there. He's a, he's a tough one, but just use the name of Jesus. Who's Jesus? Don't worry, son. Just use the name of Jesus. Okay, Dad. What are we getting paid? Oh, we're going to get 20 kittens. Okay, awesome. Kittens. How much of that do I get? Two. Oh. <laughs> All right. That's what you get for being the new guy in the company. <laughs> Can you see how that kind of goes down? Mm -hmm. That's a little, that's the King James Living New, new World Translation. <laughs> 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 Read between the lines, though. Can you see it? There's the story. Don't go there. In fact, I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 6. But I'm going to jump over to Matthew <coughs> chapter 7. And many of you have heard this passage of Scripture before, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reel it in a little bit in your understanding. Matthew chapter 7. Away. Verse 21, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall, shall enter into the kingdom, kingdom of heaven. heaven. But he that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me Lord, in that day, Lord, 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 did not we prophesy in thy name? name? And by thy name did we not cast, cast out, demons? out demons? Seven sons of Sceva. You understand this passage of scripture now? Jesus was prophesying. He saw what would be taking place. He knew that his name would be blasphemed among the nations. He also knew that it would be exalted among the nations. Did we not prophesy in your name? Did we cast out demons? And by thy name do mighty, many mighty works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Because they don't know God. The seven sons of Sceva didn't know God. Because when you know God, you don't have to evoke 
evoke God's name from the third person. You do it from the from your per, from a personal pronoun perspective. Amen. Because you have a living relationship with Him, and the devil recognizes whether or not you have a relationship with God or not. But these men didn't have a relationship with God. They were evoking God's name for money's sake. And we got to be very, very careful in the church. We got to be very, very careful about what we do and what inspires us to do it. God forbid that it be money or filthy lucre. Because when we stand before God on Judgment Day, He's going to say to many, I never.